Namaste. So today we're going to look at the 39th verse of the second chapter of the Karika, the commentary by Godapad, that is Shankaracharya's guru's guru on the Mandukya Upanishad. And this is a wonderful verse. Check it out. Asparsha yogo vai nama durdasha sarva yogi bihi yogi no vibhyati hi asman bhayo bhaya darshinaha. This yoga, which indeed is called unrelated to anything, is hard to attain by all yogis in general. The yogis are afraid of it, for they see fear in it, where there is really fearlessness. So this is the situation. This is why this non-dual yoga is not taught in any yoga schools. Even in places like Ramanashramam, they have to change the teaching in order not to confront this stage of yoga, non-duality even though they say that's their goal, in practice, it's not so. Why? They're afraid. Bhaya. Huh? Because, why? This yoga is called unrelated to anything. Asparsha yoga vai nama. Why is that? Because in Brahma, in Brahman, there isn't anything else for it to relate to. That's the meaning of non-duality. To be related requires an other. But in non-duality, there is no other. The famous response by Ramana Maharshi when asked, how should we treat others? He said, there are no others. Of course, the questioner was asking from the point of view of duality, and he was responding from the point of view of non-duality. So this is the problem. The yogis, although they say they want non-duality, actually want duality. Why? Well, Shankaracharya explains it in his purport to this verse. He says they actually want enjoyment. They actually want to keep the ego. They actually want to remain separate from the whole and be an individual and so on. And all of that entails. So <laughs> the yogis are afraid. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about the time back in 1984 when I first realized Brahman. I was in such bliss. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm still in bliss, but in, the, in those days, it was like so palpable and so strong and powerful. I decided to test whether this was real or not. And first, I went to a local tea shop. And make a long story short, all the people there completely ignored me. Like I didn't exist. Like I wasn't there. The plants and the birds and other animals around there were very aware of my presence and we had nice in energetic interactions, but the people were like cardboard cutouts, dead, dull, asleep. So after that, I said, hmm, this is very strange. 
I know, I'll go to the yoga school. There was a yoga school nearby. In fact, an association of yoga schools, like some kind of a Portland association of yoga teachers or something like that. So anyway, I went to this place, <laughs> which was pretty close to where I lived. And I went in and there were several yoga teachers all sitting around, all females. As soon as I walked in the door, they all got up like in a group and moved into the back room, leaving me standing there completely alone. <laughs> they could not face me. They could not confront me. They could not deal with my energy. And that's why also this channel is comparatively unpopular compared to other teachers of so-called non-duality who are really not teaching non-duality at all. They're teaching ordinary dualistic yoga in the name of non-duality. Like I said in a recent video, they change the definition of the terms so they can use non-duality as a virtue signal. But in fact, they're scared to death of it. Why? It says right here. Durdasha Sarva Yogi Bihi. The yogis find it very difficult. Yogi no Vibhyati. They're afraid. Vibhyati, very afraid. Why? Hyasmat Bayo. They see fear in it. Bhaya Darshinaha. They see the fear, even though there's no fear. Even though, in fact, this uh, non-dual yoga is the shelter from fear. I remember one time when I was studying Buddha's teaching, somebody was asking me, how can you meditate on emptiness, on nothingness? But there's nothing there. It seems horrible, like it would be completely boring and, and just there was nothing, right? They were freaking out. And I said to them, no, actually, emptiness or nothingness is beautiful. It's the great refuge from all suffering, from all fear. Why? precisely because there's nothing. Buddha's prominent disciple, Sariputta, was giving a lecture on emptiness and nirvana, nibbana. And the monks asked him, how can you say that nirvana is blissful because there's nothing there? There's nothing felt, nothing experienced at all. And he replied, well, that's exactly why it's so blissful. There's nothing experienced. See, from the Buddha's point of view, from the point of view of non-duality, all existence and experience is painful. All perceptions are disturbing. Because, why? They're based on duality. And duality is maya. Duality doesn't really exist. <laughs> it's just an appearance in Brahman, like the snake in the rope. The snake has no real existence whatsoever. Therefore, we have to say it's not related to the rope. Because the snake doesn't exist in the rope. It's not a part of the rope. It's not derived from the rope. It's, it has nothing to do with the rope at all. So in the same way, Brahman is unrelated to everything else because everything else doesn't really exist. It's Maya, that which does not exist. It's just an illusion just a mirage, just a perception, an appearance only. Just like the waves and the ocean. 
The ocean is the reality. It's always there. The waves come and go. The waves are nothing but the ocean, yet they're different from the ocean. Isn't it? Why is that? Because of our perception. We make a distinction. We make a difference between the ocean and the waves. But actually, there is no distinction. The waves are nothing but ocean. This is what is called an epiphenomenon. An epiphenomenon means something that is due only to perception. It's not real. And foolish scientists are saying that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain function. <laughs> but actually, it's the other way around. The brain and the body and the senses and perception and everything are epiphenomena of consciousness because consciousness is the only thing that really exists. <laughs> so this is a source of great bliss to the yogis who realize non-duality. But to those who don't get it, it's fearful. It's very dangerous. Huh? Just this morning, somebody made a comment on one of my old videos in the Secret of the Golden Flower series that uh, this teaching of yours is very dangerous. <laughs> yes, it's dangerous to those who want to keep humanity enslaved and asleep. It's dangerous to those who are promoting a false teaching. It's dangerous to people who want to remain in illusion. This teaching, if people in general understood it, would mean the end of, for example, religions, the end of countries, nations, the end of politics, the end of government, the end of all society and all different categories of existence as we know them. It would be like Satya Yuga. In Satya Yuga, there were no countries, there were no kings, there were no governments. There wasn't even marriage. Everybody was a yogi. Everybody was fully Brahman realized. Everyone was in their self, their real self with a capital S. So there was no sin, there was no war or crime or greed or what to speak of money, <laughs> none of this. So if everyone became self-realized, that would be the end of society as we know it. But actually, it seems pretty clear that society as we know it is in the process of collapse. That's because everything that is illusion is temporary. Everything that is a lie is ultimately revealed and collapses and falls apart. So this is why like people change from one religion to another or from one spiritual teacher or teaching or practice to another because they get into it with great hopes that, oh, this is going to finally solve all my problems. This is going to give me joy. This is going to give me bliss and happiness. And then they learn it, they practice it for some time, and they find out it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because it's duality. <laughs> and duality is the source of suffering, the source of pain. So they say, oh, this doesn't work, and they drop it and they move on to another one. And then it happens again. So they move on to another one and another one. And, and the same is true of relationships, isn't it? The same is true of all kinds of things. Huh? My old car is no good anymore. I have to get a new one. And thus the mind jumps from one thing to another, to another, to another, like a crazy monkey, never finding satisfaction and always blaming the, its dissatisfaction on something external. But really, the cause of its dissatisfaction is internal. The fact that the mind is based on duality. 
So when we give up the mind, when we give up duality, when we give up the empirical individual self with a small s and embrace the great universal self known as Shiva or Brahman, then we find the real pleasure, we find the real release, we find the real bliss because in that mood or in that consciousness, there is no suffering. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.